So over here, we're actually going to, I actually did do the car example. Um, we're going to import WordNet again. Um, this time, we're going to run sin sets on the word car. And as we loop through each one, we're going to do part meronyms. And actually, uh, WordNet has uh, different types of meronyms and things like that. You can actually go through the documentation to find out uh, what specifically would suit your needs. Um, but over here, we actually got a bunch of stuff. We got gasoline engine, car mirror, third gear, hood, automobile engine, a bunch of other, you know, grill. It was actually a much larger list, I think I cut it down. And those, the strings that it's showing you, the gasoline engine n one means it's a noun, and it's the first definition of that term. So for instance, under hood, you see that it's a noun, and it's the ninth definition of the noun hood. Right, right. All right, so uh, over here we're going to look at holonym. So I, I put in the word wing. And again, same thing, except this time we do, we run the function part holonyms on each item in that list. And it gives us everything that a wing is a part of. Um, so airplane, bird, car, division, building. And it goes on and on. So this is pretty interesting. I mean, uh, the weird thing is that I have not yet seen this applied creatively enough anywhere. So this is something that's, you know, it's there, and if anybody can find an interesting use for it, that'd be really cool. Yes? Good question. So, but are these, the colonies and so forth, are they already defined in database, or is this computed on the fly? This is, this is not being computed on the fly. Yeah, you're right. This is, we're actually loading the WordNet corpus, and um, when you load the corpus, it has all these relationships defined in it. And um, basically, I mean, but WordNet is open, where you can actually go and contribute to it as well. Um, so. Yeah, it's, this is this is not being done on the fly. Okay. <clears throat> was, it right. done, was it done by humans to begin with? That's yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. It's a community created uh, corpus that you know is constantly growing. So it's good. To, it's also good to keep your corpus up to date. But I, how big is the database, anyways? Um. For this specifically, to be honest, I'm not really sure. Um, I don't think it's, it's as big as you would think it is. It's pretty compressed. Um, also, another thing is these corpuses are usually stored in as pickle, they're stored either as pickle objects or just flat files. Um, some of them have been optimized. Some of them have not. Um, I know. I, I believe the brown corpus is, is just uh, a pickle object and it's it's loaded on demand. There's also a lazy load uh, module for LTK, which is not covered in this. But at the end, there's a couple of resources where you can go check this out. Um, one of the things I think I left out of this is scalability issues, because that's huge. Um, you can basically throw anything at you know, processing text, but if it's not scalable, if it's extremely slow, there's really no point to it. You know? So it's, we'll take a look at some examples, and I, I think I'll bring that up a little bit more. What's that? A web API? Um, I don't believe so. I haven't looked into WordNet as far as as far as I work, WordNet is through NLTK. So this isn't the Princeton WordNet. That's something different. Princeton WordNet? Yeah, it's up yeah it is. I, I believe I believe they're the same. Okay. Okay. So actually, okay, here's here's actually this this one I thought was really interesting. Um, so what you do is um, you look at so you're looking at. Uh, hypernym paths. And hypernym is basically, it's different than a holonym, but almost similar concept. So it's basically describing things. So um, let's see. Let's look at the colors uh, maroon, magenta, uh, dark red. They're all, they're all uh, hyponyms of red, and red is a hypernym <coughs> of all of these. So you can see how this gets kind of confusing. Um, but basically what we're going to do is take one word and look at all the hypernym paths. So we're going to go through, see which which each one describes uh, what the greater entity is that it's describing until we get all the way up at the top of the word entity. They're, they all basically go up to the word entity. So let's say, um, so for robot, let's take the word robot. Basically, at the very bottom, you'll see we start with robot. So those are other similar terms, robot, golem, on the same level as it. Um, find its hypernym, mechanism, device. So these are all on the same step, and then we go up. It's a whole, it's a, a whole unit, or, um, artifact, an instrument. Go farther up, and we get to object, physical object. So basically, it gets more and more general each step you go up. 
Um, and one of the interesting things about this, especially, I, I believe I have an example for this later, is that you can actually find, you can take two completely separate objects and then find where they meet. So how, how different are these objects? Or, you know, how similar are they? And we're going to go through an example where we actually create something that calculates the similarity of different objects. What's the lemma? The lemma? Is it lemma name? Lemma section is Oh, uh, lemma names. It's basically, lemma names are, so at the bottom we have robot, golem, uh, automaton. That's the lemma. Lemma is this thing, it's not the stem of the word, but it's, it's general, uh, similar items, kind of. They, they fall within the same realm, could be used to <laughs> change the Exactly. It's, it's like, yeah, it's, it's pretty much, you know, similarly related things that could be interchangeable. So. How is it different than a synonym? Um, because a lemma is not, it, it, a lemma is actually, you go backwards, it's kind of like getting the stem, so it's, it's something that it, it originates from. So, uh, something like evil is a more specific version of bad. So it would be, so evil, uh, so bad would be a lemma of evil, but maybe not necessarily the other way around. Fun things to try. Alright, cool, this is going to be cool. Alright, so, um, feeling lonely? There, there's a chatbot actually from NLTK. Um, you can actually just, two lines you can do, from NLTK.chat, import Eliza. And Eliza is one, but there's several others, uh, I forget all their names. There's even one that actually, uh, is very rude. <laughs> yeah, he's, yeah he's, he's, there's a lot of them. Um, so you just run the function Eliza dot uh, Eliza underscore chat, and it actually starts the chat bot. Um, really simple. Okay, so here we're going to look at the same example from before through that web interface. Um, we're going to look at that same thing in NLTK. You can actually do um, from NLTK dot book. By the way, you need to get the corpus, the book corpus. Um, I believe that's in the downloader. I'm not sure if it's pre-installed or not, but um, import from LTK book, you import everything, and then you run the function babelize shell, and basically all you do is you type in a certain phrase in English, um, type in a language, and then type in run, enter, and it'll start doing, it'll start uh, translating it back and forth until the bottom's out. So uh, over here I started with the internet is a series of two, um, and then it goes down, the next English one is uh, the internet is a number of hoses. And then finally finishes with the internet is some hoses. <laughs> so this is a this is a little example of how you can actually um, have NLTK generate text for you. Um, it's nothing really useful. It's it's not going to actually construct something that useful. It just basically garbles the text and kind of randomizes a bit of it. Um, so you import uh, NLTK, and you would give it the words, and I, here I put just text, but you would give it like, you know, a large number of words, entire paragraphs. Um, you would use the function word tokenize again, and um, you would basically uh, instantiate a text object with the tokens that you created. And then you would run the function generate. Next one. It'll actually show, I highlighted the, the certain ones that are kind of switched around. So it's not completely garbled up, but you'll see there's certain uh, certain sentences that are completely mixed up around. Hey, wait. So, somebody need to go back? Yeah, I need to read it all. No, you don't need to read it all. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's boring. It's, I picked the most boring article I could possibly pick. So. <laughs> all right, so. Uh, how similar are objects? And this is actually going back to the other example how I said, you know, we can kind of calculate how, how similar two things are. Um, so from here, we're again going to be utilizing the WordNet corpus. We're going to import it. Um, and so we're going to give it A word and B word. So they're just two different words. They don't really stand for anything. So um, we're also creating a, uh, a list called similars, and this is just going to house uh, all, this, all the words that are similar to each other. Um, so the first word I'm going to do is, is language, and then the second one is barrier. And there might be some relation to them between the two, and there might not be. Uh, essentially, this will actually let us see how similar they are and where they actually kind of meet. So after that, we would just do, um, we would get the synsets 
of each word. So now we have two list objects. Uh, each one contains a synset of, uh, of for each word. After that, over here, we would actually we would actually run um, synset.name. Synset.name is actually will give you just the name of that object. So if we had a whole, um, if, you know, when you saw like the word, the part of speech, and some other information, you know, which definition it is, you could actually get just the names for each one. And we're actually going to run synsets on each one of those. These are two functions that you're going to see in the next one with the actual code. Um, they're path similarity, so it, it, it returns a score that tells you how similar two word senses are. And it's, it's based basically on the shortest path that connects the two. Um, there's also uh, Wu Palmer similarity, and it returns a score based on um, the depth of their, uh, of their least common substrate, which I believe is, is before they branch off into two completely separate things. Yeah. And this is how you would basically do that. So you would start off looping through the first list of synsets, and then immediately start looping through the second one. So for each item in, in group A, you're going to group through all the items in group B, and you're going to compare the two. Um, so you would basically take synset A, so that synset object, and you could run the function path similarity. And so if there is a path similarity, we're just going to append it to that list that we created earlier called similars. And in that, we're actually going to include the definition at the very bottom. You see the uh, synset A dot definition, synset B dot definition. And we're going to include the words themselves, as well as the path similarity. All right. Um, so what I'm doing is the first one, I'm just simply sorting that list. So we can actually sort it by the path similarity. So the path similarity is basically an index. It's always under, uh, below 1. It's, uh, it's usually a it's usually like it's usually a fraction of some sort. Um, so we're going to sort it. And then we're just going to go print each one. All the, um, all the dictionary items that we created. Are. We're just going to go loop through each one, print out the definition, print out what the word is, and the similarity score. So over here, between language and barrier, it actually found a similarity score of 0.11 repeating, which uh, I believe is calculated by the number of actual uh, hops it makes. Um, I believe it's, it's just one over the number of hops it has to make to find that path similarity where they merge. So this would be like nine. And if we go next, you'll see the actual output. And so it kind of trickles down from there. So going back when it actually gives you the, the definition of each one, if you remember, we actually printed out the definition. And the next one, it trickles down from there. So you can actually see the first two also have a similar score. Alright, so uh, the next example is poetic programming. So essentially we want to, uh, this is something pretty interesting, we want to create a program that generates haikus. Um, and a haiku is, is a poem, a Japanese poem. It, um, it, the structure is that the first line would have five syllables, the second one is seven, and the last one would have five. Um, what we're trying to do here is write a program that given any chunk of text, it'll generate a poem with that exact same structure based on the number of syllables. 